It's delightful to be here. I hadn't realized that there was another university in Vancouver, so it's really nice to see and uh, to get to hang out here a little bit and meet you folks. Um, I'm going to be talking today um, Emerging Configurations and Knowledge Expressions and New Ways of Expressing Knowledge uh, is basically what it's about. Um, this is basically half of my, labo my new laboratory, the Evoke Laboratory. I won't go through the full reason for that title, but the first half is Emerging Values and the second half is Knowledge Expressions. Uh, the Emerging Values is about values in the design of information systems and technology. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that um, is that we do uh, a graduate uh, doctoral workshop every year now, interdisciplinary graduate workshop on values in design. Um, so I'd be very happy to get students from here and maybe input from faculty on that. But today it's knowledge expression. So you've all seen the Google engrams, I assume, which is basically looking at, um, not lo looking at uh, the occurrence of words, frequency of words in the English language, printed English language, according to Google Books, which is a problematic text, um, from 1800 to 2000. Um, what I've mapped here is the blue line is wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. So wisdom's been in historic decline for the last uh, 150 years. Um, uh, knowledge is sort of going a little bit down, but it's, it's fairly stable. What's really gone up hugely is data and information. And that's sort of the conundrum that I'm going to be talking about today is um, how do we handle, how do we deal with expressing thinking about this new kind of data, this new kind of information that we're producing, um, and come out at it the other day with wisdom. Um, let's go through this very quickly. Um, this is one of my favorite book titles ever by a guy called Peter Parker. Um, Parker has written something like 20,000 books. Um, you can check them out on Amazon.com. Um, that's the 2007 to 12 outlook for tufted washable scatter rugs, bath mats for a, um, by nine feet or smaller in India. Um, I won't read this out to you, but it deals with all tufted washable scatter rugs. Um, and there's the uh, Japanese outlook for uh, 60 milligram containers of uh, fromage fray in Japan. Uh, you'll see it here, by the way, that the new copy is 495 and the used is 1018. So I don't know what. Uh, what happened to that. The reason I'm introducing this, this concept though is Peter claims to have written, Philip sorry, claims to have written over 20,000 books. And for me there has to be a point at which if you've written a book you've actually read it. Um, and, you know, and I think he, you know, he doesn't quite meet that hurdle um, with his work. But we're all aware of this kind of massive overproduction uh, which is going on in academia right now. So let me give a little bit of the origin um, and nature of the overproduction that's occurring and then look at uh, a couple of alternative uh, ways of being. Um, I'm drawing here on uh, Cliff Siskin and William Warner have a fantastic book called This is Enlightenment, uh, which is a way of reconsidering the Enlightenment epoch, um, uh, epoch from the point of view of information systems and media and especially the material production of, um, of literature. Uh, but they start off with a quote from Bacon's Novum Organum. Uh, the productions of the mind and hand seem very numerous in books and manufactures, but all its variety lies in an exquisite subtlety and derivations from a few things already known, not in the number of axioms. The reason why I'm bringing this quotation to light uh, is it suggests this kind of link between mass production of things, which led to the mass production system in factories, and the mass production of knowledge. Uh, what we can do is say that the same production system, the same enlightenment system, uh, will actually work for either. Um, Thomas Hobbes wrote, to think is to compute. Um, the enlightenment era is one that gave us um, the uh, binary system. Uh, this is a medallion struck in Leibniz's honor. Leibniz himself gets the binary system of mathematics from uh, China, from the, especially Yi Qing in China, uh, but says that it's the greatest invention in the history of mathematics um, and uses, uh, actually not the binary system, but at the same time he tries to create a universal language in which every statement in the language is a true statement um, and every paragraph is, uh, every well-formed sentence is a true statement and every paragraph a theorem. Um, so the Enlightenment period. Um, this was a period of the creation, you know, kind of 1790 or 1789, Kant writes, uh, was ist Klärung, what is enlightenment? Um, translation of this is, that was always a horrible word, hate, hateful word. 
Um, the, um, this period was one in Europe, um, especially of the creation of the disciplines, what Michel Serre calls the exologies. It was the creation of um, sociology, um, of biology, um, of all these logos-based things, the law of this, the law of that, the law of the other. Um, it's interesting today that we're in a kind of more nomos world with proteomics, genomics, and so on. So we've gone from the um, from the um, from logos to nomos. Um, and at this period, we had a huge efflorescence of information seeking. And here's a um, an information collection in the sciences. Here's an example, um, beautifully anachronistic. Um, saying that uh, as a consequence of overseas discoveries, things like Napoleon's trip to Egypt, um, the voyage of naturalists of the late, 19th, late 18th century, uh, early modern scientists were faced with what has been termed the first bioinformatics crisis. Um, so what was the solution to the bioinformatics crisis? It was very much organizing knowledge, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but organizing knowledge um, in a tree form. And um, let's just um, hear Manuel Lima um, on that issue. Power of networks uh, and the challenge of mapping an increasingly complex world. Uh, a notion of populist could be start with uh, trees. Trees have actually been you know, really important and really good symbols over the ages. Uh, we can see trees uh, all the way back from ancient Babylon to Judaism to, of course, Christianity. But even more than, than religious symbols, trees have really been important knowledge participation uh, systems throughout the ages as well. Mapping a variety of aspects, mapping the blood types between people, of course, mapping the main characters and stories told in the Bible, mapping also the main areas of science, and even mapping, of course, the species, the very species in the planet, and again, using the tree metaphor on and on and on. It's a widespread metaphor, it's so, so, so popular, it couldn't really express the human desire for order, for symmetry, for hierarchy, for simplicity, for power, oh, and it's it's true. Really a really an embodiment of the simple way we like to look at the world. And one of the oldest trees of knowledge known to man, this was actually devised by Aristotle himself, this beautiful tree of knowledge that tries to come up with a universal structure for everything that we know across the world, you know, from, from living bodies, animals, humans, and this was considered to be the first tree of knowledge, but then they have pushed this realm and a lot more uh, knowledge since then. In my view, we are living in this turning point uh, from trees to natural. We are really facing a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift in the sense that trees are not, no longer able to really accommodate the inherent complexities of the modern world. And this happens, of course, for, for a series of reasons. One of the best that are. Okay, so the tree form. Um, tree form was central to the encyclopedia that, that, the, um, uh, that the Enlightenment scholars created, folks like Diderot d'Alembert, Voltaire, and so on. Um, here's a standard tree classification of knowledge. Um, memory gets a fairly good whack on the left, which I like. Reason in the middle. And imagination gets fairly short shrift as far as knowledge is concerned. Um, but this is very much a tree ordering of knowledge. Uh, exactly the same theoretically as August Comte's ordering of knowledge um, in the 1820s, 1830s. Um, ordering again according to the Tree of Life, this is um, Carl Linnaeus's Regnum Anim Animale. Uh, again, this allows you to produce the standard biological tree, which we're all familiar with one way or another. Um, so where Aristotle gave us the Tree of Knowledge, we also get the Tree of Life. Um, and today, um, we're still seeing, even though uh, we're, we have incredibly better ways of representing it, we're still very much trapped in the tree metaphor. Um, here's a lovely tree of life example, um, which is um, being, being developed right now by treeoflife.com, I believe it is. Uh, Eubacteria, protists, plants, invertebrates, and so on. Um, um, well, I remember, the reason I brought in the manual lemur is partly to um, refer to emerging configurations. This is part of a project by the Royal Society of the Arts in England, in London, uh, doing a project for a re-enlightenment project, for reimagining the enlightenment for the current era, and what would it take to reimagine the whole knowledge-making enterprise. Um, I've been involved in a project working with them, um, and this sort, of, um, this sort of diagram, this sort of um, cartoon work is, I think, a very good expression. 
Um, so yeah, even where we have um, some fairly amazing new modes of knowledge expression, uh, is this going to happen fast enough? Oh, okay, so bring it up. No, it's not going to let me do it. Um, all right, I'm going to go out, um, miss out on that one. Um, so one of the points that the material folks make about the Enlightenment is the Enlightenment was also a time of a revolution in media, in um, um, storage of information. Uh, what you see here is the, these are the devices, Anne Blair and uh, John, uh, Peter Stolabras talk about this. Um, this is the um, organization system that was used by the encyclopedists. Uh, what you'll see is um, a way of getting random access to information. Um, the information is put on little bits of paper which are hooked together on a hook there. Um, this relates right back to the origin of the word file, which is from the French ficelle, or piece of string. Um, so the original file, the original random access, was a bit of string that could be put through holes in bits of paper. Um, and throughout, over the last couple of hundred years, we've maintained that project, one way or another, of storing all of knowledge, having access to it um, in encyclopedic form. Um, here's a couple of examples, probably familiar to most of you. Um, there is uh, uh, Top Letters Paul Otley, uh, Electromechanical System of uh, Knowledge Storage. H.G. Uh, Wells writes a fairly interesting fascist text in the 1924, I think it is, called The World Brain, uh, with a very similar kind of organization, organizational principle, one actually based on the division of labor. And then we've got um, Van der Bush's Memex down there. So we've got this enlightenment system that goes into being, and it comes into being. It's got a really good way of organizing knowledge. Um, and I think one thing that we've not really examined as uh, collectivity uh, in scholarly terms is that this was very much based on the idea that knowledge was finite, um, that we could contain all of knowledge um, within, under a single umbrella. And uh, let's look at some examples of that. This is Charles Babbage, who gave us the um, difference, uh, analytic engine and the difference engine, um, talking about the printing press. Before the printing press, the mass of mankind were in many respects almost the creatures of instinct. Now the great were encouraged to write, knowing that they may accelerate the approaching dawn of that day which will pour a flood of light over the darkening intellects of their thankless countrymen. Um, <laughs> Babbage was pretty unpopular. Um, seeking that higher homage, alike independent of space and time, which their memory shall forever receive from the good and gifted of all countries and all ages. Very similar comment made by Buffon in France at that stage. We're past the era of the great genius um, in natural history. Um, what we have now is just putting another brick in the wall, as Poincaré um, talked about in his philosophy of science at the end of the 19th century. Um, and uh, Comte, who I referred to before, uh, decides to do away with the um, the Catholic calendar and Catholic names and replace it with these good and gifted of all ages. Um, here's the final 13th month on the right, which is consecrated to modern science. Um, and it's interesting to see how many of those have survived. Copernicus and Tycho Brahe for Monday, uh, Monday the 1st, certainly true. Uh, when we get to Monday the 22nd, Francis Harvey, we know, uh, Charles Bell, I happen to know on the physiology of the hand, um, but totally obscure at the moment. Uh, 25th, Aller and Vic d'Azir, I have no idea who they are. Ends with Gaul, who gave us phrenology um, at the end of the month. Um, so this idea that we had all of knowledge and that just as we could you know, have under Moses, Prometheus, Hercules, Orpheus, Ulyss Orpheus, Ulysses, so on the right we already knew who the great figures in science were. At the turn of the 20th century, Lord Kelvin wrote, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Exactly the arguments that were being made at the um, turn of the 19th century, uh, sorry, early 19th century by folks like Babbage talking about the decline of British science, uh, where he writes about, um, you know, basically, um, it, it's all already been said by Newton. Uh, Kant writes, astronomy has all it's always already been done uh, once we got Laplace into place. So very much 
Um, this idea of pumping out the knowledge, but pumping it into it, keeping it into a finite container and organizing it within a finite container. Um, H, uh, Humphrey Davies, uh, earlier in the 19th century, made vain search for the aristocracy now for philosophers. There are very few persons who preside, um, pursue science with true dignity. It is followed more as connected with objects of profit than those of fame. The idea was, you know, for Davy and many in Europe, you know, from the early 19th century and throughout the 19th century, that science was that which was done by a very small elite, maybe 1,000, 1,500 folks scattered all over Europe, um, with a few in the outback, you know, in kind of different parts of the world. Um, and this is the, um, this is the line of reasoning which very much broke down. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular quote. Um, this is a fantastic, weird novel by Gabrielle Tard, um, who's come back in, in sociological and philosophical circles in about the last five to ten years in interesting ways. Uh, but he's imagining the end of the earth. Um, and at the end of the earth, um, our savants today work deductively on those data which are henceforth changeless and inviolate. And they exactly recall on a much larger scale the theologians of the ancient world. So from many different sources, many different ways, we get this idea of a single, um, single organization of knowledge and the finitude of knowledge. And if knowledge is going to be finite, we've got a very good way of keeping it. That's in the academic journal. Um, here's the first academic journal that I know of from the um, Royal Society in England, the Philosophical Transactions. Uh, it gives way to a whole series of journals through the 19th century, which have this lovely phrase, the, you know, the archives for the uh, exact sciences, the annals of physics, the idea of creating a permanent archive um, of all of knowledge, which again should be re-read re -read and reused. The first discipline to get rid of the archival notion um, was that I know of as physics where basically the archival literature is a complete epiphenomenon at the moment. It's the preprint. It's the archive X, where the real work is being stored. Um, that which gets into the archival literature is never actually read, generally not cited either. Um, citations, um, we've got a very good um, um, mode of dealing with infinite knowledge in academia that we only generally cite stuff for the last five or 10 years. Um, and this led to a proliferation of journals. Um, so within a couple of um, months of the um, invention of the, um, of the car, we had a journal called The Horseless Age. Um, uh, someone, actually Lisa Gittleman pointed at me to this, and I really love it just for the fact that we now have the wireless age, but this isn't the first less age that we have. We had the <laughs> horseless age before that. Um, so how many articles? Um, impossible to say. Um, since time began, about 50 million. One, for, uh, one paper for every base pair in human chromosome Y, which doesn't really hit me all that hard. Uh, one page, one paper per tweet at Twitter on an average day in 2010. Um, peer review, pr in, in trouble um, in this process. Um, I'm willing to, you know, having served as a journal editor for the last five years, um, I'm willing to go into it length, but I want to get onto the rest of the talk about the problems with the peer review process right now. But in many ways, peer review is broken. Um, ooh, okay, too fast. Um, this is um, actually from Archive X, um, a rather um, disillusioning paper saying that um, uh, the majority of um, scientific citations are copied from lists of references and other papers. Um, here we show that a model in which a scientist picks three random papers. Um, and copies a quarter of their references accounts quantitatively for the distribution of citations. So it's as if it were a completely random system, um, the system of citation. Um, I think that's going too far, but I think it's an interesting thing. So the idea of the author again. We very much had the idea of, um, you know, which grew up with the printing press and very much the nature of still the way we teach in academia of the single author. Um, we now have the Higgs boson. Um, yielding um, not only the god particle, but an astounding list of thousands of authors um, attached to the discovery of the boson. Um, Karen Knorsatina writes about this very nicely in physics uh, around the epistemic community, where the whole community publishes everything. Um, so they've got 6,000 authors. Um, and it's very, very difficult to work out you know, what it means to be the you know, 3,597th author um, in a set like that. Um, 
And we're facing, by the way, I think there's some very interesting research, which probably you folks know better than I do, about micro citations and citation of databases right now. I think that's a really interesting and open field. Very few disciplines actually have uh, good models for citing databases at the present. Uh, let's skip that example. So, um, in all this, the reader has sort of got, gotten left out of the equation. Who is actually going to be reading, you know, sitting down and reading all of this stuff, all of this fantastic output that we're producing, all of, this, all of these books that you buy and you say, well, one fine day when I've got a spare moment, um, I'm actually going to read this stuff. And you don't. I mean, I've got these, fan used to, when I had photocopies, had these fantastic piles where the pile of papers I was going to read on a rainy day just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then I trashed it. Um, then I started another pile. Then I trashed that. Uh, a friend of mine had a theory that um, photocopying a paper was basically equivalent to reading it. Um, you, know, you could certainly feel <laughs> virtuous enough about it. Um, so, very little theory of reading. Um, Ezra Pound wrote a fantastic ABC of reading in the 1950s, but um, very little theory of how we read, um, how we read this enormous output. Um, new devices coming into play, I'm just throwing this up because I loved it. The Quran Read Pen, where you can choose your holy voice, you can choose your translation. And as you scan the Quran, um, you will get the reading of it. Um, but let me show you quickly, if that's going to let me do it. Um, uh, OK, this is a site um, that a group of us have put together. Um, called eConfigs, and I'm not, unfortunately the screen's not working very nicely for me. It's emerging configurations of knowledge expression, or emerging configurations of the virtual and the real. And the way in which we organized the site um, was, uh, there's a series here of either um, um, PowerPoint slides, there's Alan Yu talking about the book, Kathy Marshall, video clips, um, we worked with a graphic artist, uh, we tiled the document, um, and as we tell the document, we put in um, uh, discussions at each point. Um, so here's Corey Knobel. The ways in which we choose to communicate our scholarship and our research. Now, I will not explore this in detail, but I just want to refer to the fact that we've had the standard problem of websites with this, that people have gone to the website um, this is kind of annotation on annotation on annotation. We've mixed the media in, I think, some really interesting ways. We've got some great scholars and scholarship. People basically spend about 10 or 15 minutes on the site. Um, they ego surf, they look for themselves, and then they go away again. Um, we're, this is about to go into full release, so we hope it's going to be better. But we've come to realize that um, not only you know, in terms of reading the old output, but in terms of reading the new kinds of multimedia output, um, that we're creating when you, we need new kinds of skills. Um, so, what is this new output? How do we read it? How do we understand it? Well, one major form is the database. Um, this is a kind of net plus ultra. Um, if you want to invest in it, Kickstarter has it. It, it uh, is a camera that you can kind of um, pin onto you. It's very small. You can pin onto any part of your body. It'll take a picture every two seconds, um, sorry, two, two pictures a minute every day of your life um, so that you'll never forget anything that you might want to possibly have remembered at some future point. Um, but the database itself, let's think about the database as the product that we should be reading and analyzing, the product that we should be engaging with directly rather than going through the process, the kind of fairly artificial process of the academic paper. This is exactly what Walter Benjamin was suggesting um, about 40, 50 years ago when he wrote, and even today, as the current scientific method teaches us, the book is an archaic intermediate between two different card index systems, for everything substantial is found in the slip box of the researcher who wrote it and the scholar who studies it, and who studies in it, assimilated into its own card index. This is the Bristol cards that many of us used in those days associated with the theory, with structuralist theory. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm going to go over a little bit here. 
Um, here's one I like, um, an indication of virtual archaeology. Uh, archaeology right now is a field, the field of virt virtual archaeology is working on the principle that you don't even need to dig stuff out of the ground if you've got good ways of reading stuff that's in the ground. You then produce hypotheses through a virtual environment. You then test the hypotheses in the virtual environment and you really don't need any more than that in order to produce, deal with, play with knowledge. Um, here's one of the, my favourite reading forms. Um, new reading forms. This is um, out of the journal Vectors, um, and it's by David Theo Goldberg, who runs the um, Humanities Research Institute in Irvine. What you see here is words come down, you click on a word as it comes down, it descends into the database through the layers of the city. Um, and you then get access either to video clips, um, census data, um, news, so on and so forth. <laughs> now, very difficult to read this stuff, um, but I think it's, it, it's worth thinking both at the production element about how to produce it and at the other end about how to read it. Um, I'm just going to give a, a teaser here. Bruno Latour has a new book called, um, out in French now, called Enquête sur les modes d'existence, uh, where he's been working for about four or five years on the design of new book forms. Um, and that new website should be out in the next month or two, and I think it's going to be fantastic. Um, this is actually the main work, um, you know, he says the main work of his life. Um, if you want to check out other forms of production that Latour's been doing in his lab at uh, Sciences Politique in Paris, uh, they've been working on uh, mapping scientific controversies and using a visual database and representation of scientific controversies as a direct input into policy discourse. So again, not going through the normal knowledge product that we deal with. So the final theme that I want to spend a few minutes on is knowledge as performance. Um, but we often think of knowledge as you know, that which is encased within a book, that which is between uh, the, uh, you know, in the binding of the text. But increasingly, performance um, is actually, I think, a pretty interesting way of thinking about knowledge. Uh, many of you will recognize this. This is from the TED Talks, Hans Riesling, um, where Riesling is a, is a beautiful performer. Um, you know, he does stuff like, um, you know, one of his TED Talks, he, you know, he doffs his academic robe, revealing this kind of la gold lame costume underneath and does, uh, swallows a sword. And he really is very much a performer. Um, but this gap-minded technology, which is very rich technology, is a performative technology um, as much as it is a representational technology. Um, this is a project, um, a reference to a project uh, called Atlas in Silico, uh, which is being done by the artist Ruth West at University of California, San Diego. Um, and she's interested in how do we actually navigate very, very large databases and play with large databases. Um, so what she does is you've got the projection of the, actually the metadata in the database there. You can tweak the metadata. As you tweak the metadata, you get an automatic representation um, of uh, the density and some of the contours of the metadata in, the, um, in a sonic environment that's created automatically, algorithmically. And at the same time, uh, you get um, a characterization of where you are in the database and what's happening in the database at that point in terms of an artificial language automatically generated out of the um, Plato's six, I think it is, perfect solids. So again, playing with this, this idea that you are engaged directly in a performative way with the database and use that as a way of exploring and generating knowledge directly. Um, well, going back to the tree metaphor, um, I'm not going to make much of this, but this is one of my favorite recent examples. Um, this is um, a camera which scans tree rings for their thickness, growth rate, texture, and overall tone, turns it into a piano piece, and then you can use the piano piece as a, again as a way of accessing the data. On the performance of knowledge, I, this is not a mistake, do not switch, switch off. Um, I think PowerPoint gets massively underrated, uh, even by, you know, especially by folks like Tufty. Uh, PowerPoint is very much a performative medium. 
I'm not alone among my many friends who say, well, we've got a billion talks which should be papers, but they're never going to quite be papers. We can't quite be buggered writing them up. Um, so what we do is we have these, pa these PowerPoint slide decks. Um, computer scientists in a conference I was at recently you know, talked about, well, we've got to preserve our slideware. Um, you know, can you share your slideware? So the slideware is sort of an equivalent productive form to software or hardware. Um, another form of knowledge production, uh, which I am getting into on the other side of my lab right now on emerging values, uh, this is Garnet Hertz, um, who uh, works with Arduino. Um, but it's a movement that's kind of started by Matt Ratto at University of Toronto called Cri Critical Making. And it's making, designing artifacts in the world in such a way that they force you to think philosophically. Um, and so, again, new ways of occasioning knowledge and thinking about knowledge. Um, won't get into... There is work going on right now, although I don't have time to go into it in detail, on dancing knowledge. So again, another performative way of understanding the knowledge production process. Uh, here's the um, uh, rather silly version of it. Some of you will know that Science Magazine every year does a um, competition to dance your PhD. Um, this is one of the great dancers, the micro property relations in TI2448 components produced by selective laser melting. A love story. Um, so, in conclusion, um, a couple of things. One is, we have the potential right now of really expressing knowledge and dealing with knowledge in completely new ways. What we are doing largely is, and for very fairly good reasons, is reproducing the old ways. Um, this is um, a um, chronozoom, which um, uh, Microsoft is trying to push as the new architecture for all information to be held in the future. Um, it works on a very, very flat timeline. The very, very flat linear timeline of the book. There's no relationship between timelines. There's no room for rhythms. There's no room for returns. There's no room for catastrophe. Um, everything just fits into this one darn thing after another, which is the kind of temporality that Elizabeth Eisenstein and others associated with the development of the printing press. Um, we do have new possibilities now. Um, I would argue that we don't have to deal with the big printing press in the sky anymore. Um, and indeed, as we approach the singularity, and we're only about 30 years away now, um, as we approach the singularity, um, you know, I think that we really need to think about reworking our understanding of what knowledge products are and how they're developed and how they should be engaged. So not only what, how we should be producing knowledge, but how we should be reading knowledge and as I've argued, I think that the database is one key way into this process. Thank you. Okay, at this point I believe we can entertain about 20 minutes of questions, so please. We can turn the lights on? Yes, someone can, that'd be nice. Someone can reach those switches. Caroline. Well, you know, we talked in work you've done before and, and the concept between data and narrative. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can talk again. If the database is the, the source, it's, it's constantly the separate pieces. Do we have now, a, do we have a narrative for every individual? Do we have any concept of common knowledge if we each have a different uh, access and, and, and route through the, the information? Or perhaps we're already, perhaps we do already have information, individual narratives. I think that's a really good question. I mean, you know, I mean, a couple of parts of an answer to that. And one is the, I mean, you know, when Manovich talks about data and, you know, the relationship between data and narrative in that sense, he says, well, databases are structured objects. And one way or another, um, the database constrains the forms of narrative you can take. It constrains by what kind of fields it assumes, but also um, by what kind of algorithms it permits. Um, so we don't have, you know, infinite sets of narrative space here. Um, we actually have, you know, whenever we're dealing with a database, and the web is basically a database, whenever we're dealing with a database, we're dealing with a very, very, you know, very restricted set of stories. And um, being able to think about and modulate other kinds of narrative is, I think, really important. Um, with respect to the universality of knowledge, I think that's a, it's sort of a whole other issue. And I'm not quite certain where I stand on it right now. Um, I think there's... Um, 
the essential point that science studies has been making for the last 20 or 30 years is, you know, the standard historian thinks, it, you know, it could have been otherwise. Um, we constructed a certain form of universal knowledge. That doesn't mean that it's um, not constructed. It doesn't mean that it's not socially inflected. It doesn't mean that it's not culturally inflected and theologically inflected, but it's universal. Um, so I think the choice is now not between, and, but it's not the only universal. Um, so the possibilities right now, the real po creative possibilities, are creating new forms of universalism uh, and playing with that. And I think that's a kind of flexibility which is permitted um, by this new medium. It's not necessarily going to flow from the new medium. And I think lots of folks think about the internet in terms of, you know, well, everything's happened now. You know, the, uh, you know, the internet exploded. And you know, now we know what this new inf information infrastructure is going to look like. Um, on any past history of any previous information infrastructure, it takes about 200 years um, for an infrastructure to really um, you know, kind of hit those kind of, as Brian Arthur would say, what is it, the um, path determining steps or whatever it is. So we're, we're not there yet as far as the internet's concerned. It's still very, very open. There's no reason to believe that it's gone faster and we've thought better about it than we have about previous ones. Um, right now, I'd say we're in a phase which is exactly the argument that Paul David used about the, um, about the computer paradox um, in the 1960s, where you bring computers into the workplace, productivity goes down for 20 years. You bring electric generators into the uh, factory, productivity goes down for 20 years. And the reason is that um, computers are actually very bad typewriters, and uh, electric generators are very bad steam generators. Um, so the attempt to which we try and do more and more of the same, um, I think we're still pretty much in that mode at the moment, um, problematically. So this is going to start out seeming like it doesn't go anywhere, mm -hmm. but there's a paint maker down on Granville Island, and that paint maker has a color called Granville Gray. Mm -hmm. And what Granville Gray is, is it's a gray that's manufactured from all the particles from paint that happen to be laying around. Mm -hmm. So the point is that every single batch of Granville Gray is in fact a different gray. Mm -hmm. But the characteristic of Granville Gray is that every single batch is a different batch. Right. And I sort of feel like we're in that era of information that if you look at a data set today, your understanding that you construct or take away or your reading of that data set is uh, a moment in time Mm -hmm. And this was really hit home to me yesterday. I was talking to my RA who's been working on this genomics project and he's been documenting instances in which genomic results have been recanted mm -hmm. because they can't reproduce them. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of reasons for that. You know, we're constantly developing new algorithms through which to make sense of the existing genomic data that when you compress the genomic data, it changes it and a bunch of other stuff. So I just wonder if you can comment about that. It, like, it's a huge problem. Um, and, I, you know, obviously we know that, that uh, knowledge isn't universal and that knowledge is constructed and that it does change over time. But the notion of us living in a sort of Granville Gray era where every single batch that comes off the line is slightly different is a really different time or way, it seems to me. Yeah, um, difficult, yeah, that's, that, that's a great observation. Um, let me take it in two parts. I mean, first about the repl uh, replicability um, of, you know, kind of, are you going to a new database every time you play with data? Um, and I, to some extent, yes. I mean, to some extent you are in the sense that um, there's theory that goes into compression, there's theory that goes into ways of storing vast amounts of information. It's the same, you know, the kind of standard science, science studies thing that how many, um, how many um, rings you have around Saturn depends on, um, you know, it, it, it's a choice. It's not a, it's, there's not an absolute number of rings around Saturn. It depends on how you define ring and what kind of luminosity you're going to use as you define it. Um, so in that sense, I think, um, yeah, I mean, knowledge is very much up for grabs all the time. I think one of the really interesting things um, I have a friend, David Rebus, who did a really nice study around um, um, tunnel, uh, tunneling electron microscopes. Uh, the, the scientists themselves who were using the microscopes didn't understand the technology that they were using, couldn't engage with the technology, 
Um, and there was actually controversy about what you see through a tunneling electron microscope. I mean, it's a theoretical construct that you get out of the other end of the day. But um, you, um, the, the controversy was over there, it was inaccessible to the scientists themselves. And the scientists thought they were dealing with this kind of hyper-reality. Um, what we get right now, and uh, Michael Goodchild has written about this beautifully in, um, in geography, um, is this false sense of hyperreality of certainty in the representations that we have. Um, and that's what I'm more worried about than the gray is, is kind of these absolutely beautiful stark colors. Um, where if you look at representations of America, you know, maps of America, um, maps are good to within about you know, 10 to 20 me meters, I think it is, or something like that. That uncertainty is never actually represented. Um, and representing uncertainty um, would actually be a really nice way of getting back into some gray areas and being able to kind of rethink things um, in new ways. Um, I could, could do more on that, but um, I'm not really engaging with your central point, which is, um, the central point as I take it, which I might be misinterpreting, is that every, you know, every visit then becomes a new visit. Um, and so it's a little bit the counter of Caroline's point that, that every, you know, every trajectory through a database is an individual trajectory. Um, I would say let's play with that. I mean, I have no problem with radical pluralism. Um, and I think radical pluralism is something that we're really missing in society right now. And I think part of the Enlightenment model was to say there is a one true right and only way. Um, and that's precisely the kind of thing, well, that's, actually, that's precisely the way in which Bruno starts off you know, his new book on uh, inquiring into the modes of existence. Um, that really, um, saying that there is a one right answer or a single way of viewing an issue, and that's the right way of viewing it, is really taking a theological discourse from pre-Enlightenment days and putting it into um, belief in science and the religion of science today. Um, so I think there's absolute room for us to play with radical pluralism. And even if that does lead to various shades of grey, at the same time, it also suggests new modes of exploration are possible. Yes. Yeah. So um, to risk going into your other line of work, or the, the values area, I just uh, was working on a piece with um, Nassim Jafari Naimi from Georgia Tech and some others, basically around radical pluralism, although we didn't call it that, mm -hmm. but it was um, values pluralism, mm -hmm. values as hypotheses, mm -hmm. rather than values as gems that are set and fast, and that tends to be the rhetoric around in the media, the way we talk about what privacy and these things is as though we know what this is, yeah. and that is something that you can point to. Yeah. Can you, you know, kind of, work into that area a little bit in terms of how you conceptualize and think about values? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I know this scene was actually one of our values in design cohort a few years ago, so um, that's, um, the point for me around this, well, there's a, there's a beautiful article that came out, um, I think last year in American sociology called uh, it's a, flanking, a Flank Movement on the Theory of Values. <laughs> or a flanking movement on the theory of values. It's by a guy called Fabien Muniesa, um, M-U-N-I-E-S-A. Um, if you want the reference, I'll, I'll send it to you. But um, the argument that he's making is that, um, and I think it fits in very much with what we're talking about, and fits in with your idea of the hypotheses, values as hypotheses, is that we make a mistake if we say values is a list of things that we have. Uh, we believe in truth, justice, the American way, apple pie, Barack Obama, you know, we've got a set of values you know, that we hold as if they were nouns that existed outside of action in the world. Um, and so he goes back to Dewey and uh, the pragmatist philosophers from the 19th, you know, who are very pluralist philosophers you know, from the uh, early part of the 20th century, and say, no, values are verbs, and valuation is what we should be dealing with, not values as, as, as kind of contains in the world. And I think that's an extremely rich way of looking at it. And, and again, I think it fits with this kind of pluralist model that Caroline and, and Ellen are, you know, are pushing towards. Uh, within the specific, um, you know, tying it more directly to, the, to, the, uh, to what I was talking about here, I mean, there is the question of what is the role of the author and what is the nature of the author. Um, I mean, the idea of Bruno's new project is basically there will be a collective author by the end of the day. It will have been seeded by Bruno, but the authorship itself will be a collective authorship, and there will be a final product which is produced as a collective product. Um, now, that sort of way of acting in the world, where you 
loosen the ties of what it means to be an author. And in so far as um, some of the experiments have failed very, very badly. I mean, Jochai Benkler did this with the Wealth of Networks. The downside of the Wealth of Networks was it got spammed and hacked several times over. Um, so nobody actually ended up, you know, kind of building off, building off his seeds. Um, but I think the idea, um, in, in a sense, what I was trying to push to a little bit today um, is um, yeah, kind of going back and lit crit to um, reader response theory. Uh, it's what's the relationship between the reader and the text? What's the relationship between the reader and the product? Um, and we often see reading as being an active, passive, uh, sorry, as being a passive phenomenon. Um, you know, literally, you are a tabula rasa, or um, you know, or you've got you know Freud's mystic pad, which is one of those you know kind of wax pads where you write on it and then you pull it up and it's empty again. Um, but as if you know, this whole idea of the tabula rasa view of the reader, and the reader takes every, everything from the text. Um, when I was dealing with databases, I was trying to get at a much more engaged view of readership, where you're not reading a single text; you and the author are creating this text simultaneously. Um, as you're engaging with it. So I think that changes a kind of, that potentially changes the power dynamic, um, which is a highly problematic power dynamic in the way in which you produce knowledge today. Yeah. Um, one of the, uh, my threads of thinking is that one of the things we need to abandon in order to embrace this, a new way of thinking about the world, is preservation, is, is preserving everything we do. And, yeah. um, you know, in our field, we're pretty much obsessed with doing that. Um, what do you feel, how do you feel about that? Is it something we need to just let, let it go? Oh, I said, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, Freud and others, you know, write absolutely beautifully. I'm forgetting it's actually a really good thing. I mean, you know, um, you know and Benjamin says, what is it? Consciousness, um, you know, consciousness occurs at the site of forgetting or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's ways in which, there's this a whole other line of argument. <coughs> Give me a second on it. Um, there's ways in which this is, um, we're trying to create an eternal present right now. This is one of the arguments I was trying to make in memory practices and sciences. And the eternal present is pretty much like Babbage's eternal present, that we're all going to be sitting around the table together. Um, or E.M. Forster had a vision of all the authors, all, all the great authors are going to be sitting around in a single room in the, in, in the British Library. Um, and we will have perfect memory through text. Um, and in fact, that, you know, that eternal present I find highly problematic. Um, Todorov has written one of the best books for me on that, which is on the abuses of history, um, where he talks about the fact it would actually be really, really nice if we could forget the Holocaust, which is sort of sounds like a horrible thing to say. Um, but in a sense, what we're doing right now is creating a regime which keeps the wound open as long as we can possibly keep the wound open. That ain't necessarily a good thing to be doing in the world, even though it's controversial to say it. Um, so I think there are some things which it's, way, it's a way good idea to forget them, it's a way good idea to ditch them. Uh, the other example I use there about permanent memory is um, look at the difference, well, actually, between um, New York and Paris. You draw a 10 um, mile radius around the center of Paris, 10 mile radius around the center of New York. Paris is a newer city than New York is because um, Paris is always rebuilding itself and always changing itself. That's why they can do outrageous things like you know, the Pyramid and the Louvre. Um, or if you go, to, uh, or if you go to, um, to Italy, fantastic tagging that occurs on the walls there. Sorry, fantastic old murals on the walls there from the 18th, 17th centuries. Nowhere near as interesting as some of the tagging that's going on in LA, um, which are constantly being wiped out. There's a great site called Graffiti Archaeology, which traces graffiti in, um, uh, graffiti in San Francisco over a 20-year period. Um, so I think, A, preserving is not possible. Um, We've absolutely, you know, everyone is, well, as, and this is preaching to the converted, I mean, you know, kind of, everyone thinks memory is cheap. Incremental, incremental metadata is incredibly expensive. And until we've got institutions that actually do the memory preservation, it's really not going to happen. And we've certainly got no evidence of any form of medium which is going to last longer than, print, than the um, printed word on acid-free paper, which lasts at least is it two and a half thousand years, I think. Nothing electronic is going to last two and a half thousand years. Um, old um, um, banks, for example, have to maintain machinery from the 1950s and 60s, which still runs COBOL 80, um, because it doesn't run under new operating systems. So you've got to maintain the old machinery in order to run the algorithms, in order to get the work that you want to do. Um, so I think creative destruction is a really, really good thing in the world. And I think this, I mean, this whole idea that, you know, 
you know, we should be in this kind of perfect memory epoch. I find it highly, highly problematic. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So I'm curious what you, what your thoughts are on traditional knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, especially, you know, sort of the last decade with climate change, there's been this huge push to get uh, TK or TK into, you know, shoehorn it basically into these enlightenment modes of recording and preserving. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, Corey Hayden writes beautifully about that. I mean, you know, kind of, you know, Corey writes about, and it's really interesting in a couple of ways. She writes about the Sonoran Desert and the knowledge of, um, Knowledge of microbes and uh, sorry, active verbs and uh, active verbs in Sonoran Desert, um, and a couple of issues there. One is that the um, the people who go and collect the data are not actually getting the traditional knowledge; they're getting the itinerant salespeople who are moving from village to village. So those are the people who are getting rewarded for the traditional knowledge. When the traditional no, traditional knowledge is created, it then gets put put into free text and databases, which is never accessed. Um, precisely because it doesn't fit into that Procrustean bed of the organization of the Western big pharma databases. Um, the most interesting work on that, you know, I suspect you know already, is Helen Brands, um, where she's been working for a number of years. I mean, the real issue there is ontology, and how do you design for multiple, onto um, multiple ontologies? Um, and she's had, um, I mean, to, let me give two examples. I mean, one is um, she, she did a fire burning with a group of Aborigines, Yongu, in Northern Australia several years ago, and brought together groups of the Yongu and environmental scientists and confronted them one with the other. And it was a sort of a failed experiment, but it was, it was interesting in the sense that they were really trying to you know, work this out as an ontological thing without passing through the ontological negotiation, without passing through the medium of uh, the Procrustean bed of the way in which knowledge is normally expressed. Um, so there are ways in which that worked. Um, there was a similar project that um, Peter Weston did um, in the southwestern states several years ago, um, where he uh, brought together a group of Maasai tribes people um, from, the, um, from um, Kenya um, to the southwest of the United States uh, to um, uh, Azuni reservation there. And basically, they've got the same environmental issues they're playing with. And they've got similar sets of responses. Uh, now, neither one group nor the other is going to express their knowledge in such a way that it's going to be usefully expressed in an academic article, which is going to be read by the other. So they just cut out the middle person and said, well, let's, let's confront the two groups. And that was actually a very rich form of confrontation. Um, but I think I mean, I've been working on and off for a number of years. Uh, Michael Christie um, has done a lot of good work on this. Robin Boast at the Anthropological Museum in the um, uh, University of Cambridge. Ramesh Srinivasan uh, from UCLA. There's a number of us who are very interested in you know, representing other ways of knowing. Um, and I think, um, for me, I mean, I, I know I was just gesturing here. I mean, I felt like McCarthy, um, you know, gesturing at you know, kind of empty files. Um, but for me, this performativity thing um, has, a way, you know, has a possibility of really engaging that. I and mean, there is some interesting work now on the epistemology of dance. There is some interesting anthropology right now about dance. Um, there is the possibility through dance, through other forms of performance and other forms of engagement with knowledge, of actually, I think, being able to engage in indigenous knowledge in new sorts of ways. Um, and I think it's absolutely essential that we do it for the future. I think the way we, have, we can take one more question. The, the word you, you know, the word wisdom was what you started with. And I guess my question is, I mean, it sounds like you're wanting a resuscitation of, of the idea, not necessarily the word. Mm -hmm. um, can you say something about why the word seems so unlistenable to? Yes, um, this is a great question. Um, well, actually, we're <laughs> Sort of involved in a group now, which is we, we, which is doing this kind of. You know, we started off with you know kind of um, information infrastructure, and now the big buzzword that's coming out in states is knowledge infrastructure, and um, that's you know very much part of a movement that I'm part of of what it takes to build a knowledge infrastructure. Um, wisdom involves a different. I mean, wisdom for me cannot fit into this kind of total production mode. Wisdom has to have this kind of contemplation attached to it. Um, Contemplation is, some, is not something that we actually recognize in the society very well. Um, we don't reread stuff. We don't just kind of, we feel guilty when we take time off. Um, time off from you know, being attached one way or another to the internet. 
Um, but unless we have those moments of silence, um, wisdom is basically not going to happen. Um, now, the argument of folks like you know, Kurzweil and the singularity folks is that somehow wisdom is going to be an emergent property um, of this meta-intelligent system that we're building. Uh, and there's a tradition for saying that. I mean, that's totally hard to shout out um, in the 1950s and 60s when he talked about the noosphere and the, um, the fact that we're going to um, evolve this noosphere, you know, which will contain new, new, numinously all of knowledge. Um, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's really interesting and attractive. Um, I mean, I see the intelligence that we're producing through, you know, right now, this kind of uncontemplated intelligence as much more like the anteal intelligence. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we will seem to be acting intelligently, but we will not be acting consciously around our actions. And I think that that move into conscious action is something that we train our students against, we train our children against it, and we don't practice it ourselves. So yeah, I do think that's problematic. Well, I wish we had another hour to continue the conversation, but unfortunately we've come to the end of our time here. Uh, a warm thank you for an inspirational talk from Dr. Bauer.